time we had a, a small plane go down somewhere in Africa, and we were not able to find it by surveillance. So the director of the CIA heard about a woman in California that uh, was a medium or something. I don't know the title for And she gave him the latitude and longitude of the plane's whereabouts. We located the plane where she said it was. And that's the only time that I have ever experienced something that was inexplicable while I was present. He was the most psychic man in the world, but nobody seems to know what killed him. It began with Russell Targ. The physicist in the beret there appeared at my door with a box of documents. Okay, so this is marker 701. This is where the caretaker told me I should start. And I'm gonna see what this is. This is marker 700. So indeed, indeed, past grave is entirely unmarked. All right, I think he deserves better than that. This is probably my last opportunity to say goodbye to my good friend, Pat. Pat Price often said, the more attention you place on hiding something, the more it shines like a beacon in psychic space. Pat Price died in 1975, and some people believe it was because of his work with remote viewing. Psychic spies, Cold War whimsy, or secret weapon. Some people may have certain psychic powers. This may reassure you, it may alarm you, but in fact, for some years now, the U.S. intelligence community has wagered a modest amount of money on the possibility that such powers do exist. Such powers do exist. Do exist. But the most enduring experiments have been in the field of remote viewing. We got into it when we discovered that they were in it. We found that many individuals are able to accurately describe what's going on in distant locations, blocked from any kind of ordinary perception. Are you saying that the work you've been doing is classified? I really can't talk about uh, matters of classification, as you can imagine. My name is Russell Targ, and I'm a physicist. This is our last chance to tell our story. I haven't been on a road trip like this for many years. They always assume that people are immortal. I hope the people who have seen and used operational material will say, yes, that really happened. A huge trove of material was declassified by the CIA. So this is really the first time that the people who were cognizant of secret material can talk about it. At one time, humanity worshipped fire. The shamans called it magic, and the people feared it. And now science recognizes fire as simply another part of the natural world. Ideas change based on new evidence. But the fear of the unknown remains. The future, the future, it all looms very large. What if psychic abilities were real? What if you could look anywhere using only the power of your mind? 
And if these abilities really exist, what would that do to the world when it found out? The CIA financed a project in 1975 to develop a new kind of agent who could truly be called a spook. Dad, when you, when you told me that you were interested in using uh, classified materials, that you were eager to get them out, and you were, uh, I was principally concerned for you. And our family, no and, doubt. No, no doubt. Uh, we received a letter uh, from the CIA and said, uh, sorry, not now, but later. I said, well, Nicholas, I'm just going to publish the, the book. And I just thought that what could be more important than to help my father, one, get the documents that uh, he was seeking, but also to help make sure that he stayed out of jail. Uh, so that all seemed like a, a very worthwhile uh, enterprise. Yeah, very good thinking. And I then contacted the congresswoman in um, Palo Alto, and she submitted a letter uh, on your behalf as well. Oh, that's very nice. I didn't know that. Several months later, uh, the CIA released the documents that we had requested. And you were able to tell me the story in full detail. If I taught you to expect a miracle, it's been worthwhile. With the floodgates now open, an additional 70,000 documents on remote viewing were declassified. I can now show everybody these pictures without having to kill them afterwards. You can actually take out of thin air information about something you have absolutely no access to, just using your mind. If we want to know why the CIA was lying about our program, perhaps we should go to Detroit and talk to Kit Green, our former contract monitor. He was branch chief of the Life Sciences Division at CIA. I was given the results. The drawings showed the ability of a visual representation that appeared to be better than overhead imagery. In Pat Price's drawings, it was as if it was from inside his brain that the information was coming, not from his eyeballs overhead looking down. It was obvious to any intelligence organization that if you had an ability to be able to remotely perceive stuff, really remotely, like any place in the world, that could be an extraordinary intelligence source. The remote viewing program basically ran from the early 70s to the mid-90s. For more than 20 years, the CIA used psychic abilities operationally and in a top secret program for the U.S. government. You paid for them, you deserve to see them. CIA had said cease and desist. People said, this stuff is so intriguing that we got back into the game. We once found a guy that could see anywhere in the world through his psychic powers. We could show him a picture of any place and he could describe any activity going on there. But he died, and we haven't heard from him since. CIA Director Stansfield Turner, Chicago Tribune, August 1977. I believe when he died, he was out in Las Vegas or something, and, and uh, Kit Green rushed out there. Even though he died unattended in a hotel room, you don't need to make it a medical examiner case, although that's not correct. And he was taken to the emergency room, which I visited. Speaking now as a criminologist, I would have investigated the hell out of it. But the water's a little bit murky. So I'm going to change to a bigger fly that they can see better. Oh, there we go. We got one. So what do you do with it after you catch it? Catch and release only. The cutthroats are now pretty endangered, so you can't keep them. Where 
Yeah, the red is, it's like his throat's been cut. Yeah. Ken Kress was our long-term contract monitor at CIA. He was a physicist. Ken Kress became a mythic figure when he wrote a long paper in Annals of Intelligence describing our program, but he's never come forward. Kress had never been interviewed before this film, and every question we asked had to be submitted for vetting by the CIA. I was undercover. Uh, the fact that CIA was even doing anything with SRI was uh, confidential information. So Sid Gottlieb looked around, came up with my name because I was a physicist, and he called me in and he said, well, I'd like you to take over this project. And he said, the reason is, is there's two physicists at SRI, and I think you three can probably communicate. The first series of experiments here at Stanford Research Institute were what the scientists called remote viewing. For example, here is a reenactment of one of the first experiments last year. The subject was a New York artist named Ingo Swan. He was in the room. The experimenters, Dr. Harold Putoff and Russell Targ, were driving away in a car. Their destination was in a sealed envelope. This day it was Palo Alto City Hall. The subject did not know. But back in the room, the subject began sketching and describing where he imagined they might be. Here was the tape recording that he made then. There must be buildings around, and this would be sort of an area enclosed of some sort, a quadrangle or a quad. And then I sort of felt that there might be a fountain around, but I didn't hear any water in it. There is a fountain. That day, it was turned off. Back in the room, the subject sketched a pattern he thought was crosswalks coming together in a circle. In fact, the courtyard is paved in this pattern. The courtyard where they were is two miles from the room where the subject was. There had been no communication between them. Somehow or another, Kick Green and Ingo got together. And I, but Kick had a, came up with a report and he sent this back, circulating through CIA, and eventually got to Sid Gottlieb. Gottlieb was already predisposed to look at the psychic phenomena from 10 years ago. As the CIA's sorcerer, Gottlieb attempted to raise assassination to an art form. Out of his labs had come many debilitating potions. We knew who Sid Gottlieb was. He was the director of the famous MK Ultra program. This is by 1974. MK Ultra was the CIA's notorious mind control program in the 1950s and 60s, where they were giving LSD to people to see if you could create a Manchurian candidate and strip away their memories. We considered him sort of the Joseph Mengele of the American side. Mengele, of course, was a notorious Nazi physician who did biological experiments on Jewish prisoners. Gottlieb was not doing that. Gottlieb, of course, is Jewish. He was just torturing other people, independent of race or religion. He's sort of equal opportunity misanthrope. From my point of view, he reminded me of my old uncle, Sid. When he died, he was out in Las Vegas died. or something. In early 1972, I briefed NASA and the CIA on proposed experiments to help people develop their psychic abilities. Well, Helen and I thought it would be very interesting to meet with Sid Gottlieb. He was enthusiastic about the idea of giving remote viewers LSD as a way of enhancing their psychic abilities. I was opposed to that. Remote viewing requires the person's conscious cooperation. And we explained that to Gottlieb and he seemed to completely understand. So he led us down into the basement of the Pentagon and it seemed to us that he was sort of stored in the basement with all of his books. The only really comfortable place we'd ever been in the CIA. The, the idea after talking to Gottlieb that the decision to give us money to go forward probably had already been made. Reports that the Soviets were using psychics to spy on us prompted us to do the same to them. There was intelligence, hard intelligence. I mean, intelligence that was like 
really, really good internal program intelligence about what the Soviets were doing in, in medicine and, and psychology that stated that they believed that United States military, United States intelligence officers, and United States scientists would be ripe for recruitment as spies if they were interested in crazy things like psychic research, remote viewing, and parapsychology. And they would tell their government people that were responsible for doing recruiting and so forth, hey, if you want to find somebody in a Washington DC area that might be pretty interesting, find somebody that spends their time doing psychic research. They must have been following Russ around constantly then. It's natural for a visually handicapped person like me to be interested in optics, magic, and extrasensory perception. I'm a legally blind motorcycle riding physicist. In 1934, I was born in Chicago. I was a child magician. I used to perform magic tricks at birthday parties and art openings. As a magician, I understand how people can be tricked. That's always made me a better researcher, especially in a field like ESP. I left graduate school at Columbia in 1956, and in 1958, I began working on the earliest development of the laser. And I was looking for a way to get into some kind of psychical research and still support my family. Russell was enthusiastic, and Hal was uh, more like what you would expect a theoretician to be. But they both came across as, you know, physicists. I heard that there was going to be a lecture at Stanford University, and there was a young physicist, Hal Putoff, giving a lecture on psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain, American and Russian ESP. And I then went back and talked to my new friend, Hal Putoff, and said, I think I got some dough. Let's talk to well, your I'm management about to creating you. a program. And he said, that would be very nice. You just have to promise that you'll keep a low profile. So that was in June of 1972. And this led to the beginning of our program at SRI to investigate psychic abilities. I look forward to coming to work. Every day had a new miracle. I feel like the child magician finally got a job doing magic. As we were doing these experiments, we began to run into flack from the psychologists at SRI. They said, you know, you've got that crazy ESP experiments going on. That's going to ruin our reputation. We're going to lose our fun and get rid of those guys. Hal had worked for several years in naval intelligence in Washington, and that may have made him a little more secretive indeed. Yep. I had access to uh, one of the most shielded experiments on the planet. It was a shielded magnetometer that measures weak magnetic fields. Against his better judgment, Hal snuck his very first subject into a forbidden lab at Stanford. The man claimed to be the greatest psychic in the world, and his name was Ingo Swan. Swan claimed that he could move the needle of an unswayable magnetometer buried under 